I go. I go. Peace, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As folks are following in, we're going to get started. If you can find your seats. Peace, everybody. Free to land. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for the National Black Radical Organizing Conference. I also want to give a big shout out to everybody that was here last night, late night, and then still made it here in this early morning. So give yourselves a round of applause for that. <laughs> I, I see some tired faces in the audience, so I'm going to hopefully keep, you, keep it interesting. So my name is Kwame Olufemi, and I'm the Cooperative Director and Safety and Security Lead for Community Movement Builders. As you all know, the theme for this conference is unity in our lifetime, connecting the national struggle for self-determination with Pan-Africanism. The organizers in this room represent and engage in so many different parts of our liberation struggles. Some are working diligently to free our political prisoners, Others are organizing communities against displacement and over-policing. We have folks here who are developing solidarity networks with Africans in Cuba and other parts of the globe across the diaspora. We have academics that are pr producing research and literature to help clarify our political ideologies and our collective path forward. Our hope is that the conference can accelerate an ability to strategically and intentionally unite these interrelated efforts and to a shared struggle for black liberation and the unification of all African people under scientific socialism. Unifying our efforts will require first and foremost, a unity of principles. We must clarify our struggle. Outside of this room, in the vast landscape of our organizing infrastructure, there are people calling themselves radical organizers whose conception of liberation is the mytho uh, mythological black capitalism or, or having more elected officials with political power in the empire like the Obamas and Kamala's. Others are organizing for so-called liberation at the explicit exclusion of black LGBTQ people or moving with a practice that ignores or dismisses poor and working class new Africans. These distractions and counter-revolutionary efforts are too often conflated with real, radical, new African struggles towards self-determination and pan-Africanism, in part because our movements lack coordinated and popularized principles. If we are not clear and unified about what we are fighting for, what we are fighting against, and who we are fighting, there is too much room for those misaligned with our values and objectives to co-opt our movements. We see this happen time and time again in both historical and contemporary struggles. Revolutionary politics and objectives get replaced by liberal and reformist compromises. The Democratic Party, for example, sees the masses of new African people taken to the streets to demand an end to police brutality, as we saw in 2020, and responds with a collective kneel while dressed in kente cloth. Corporations respond with diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and Juneteenth sales. Jay-Z is championed for taking a multi-million dollar deal with the NFL to coordinate their halftime shows as a response to the critiques on their treatment and blackballing of Colin Kaepernick. New groups dress up as Black Panthers to capitalize on the aesthetic of revolutionary activity without engaging in any real contemporary struggles. Social media influencers start GoFundMes and organizations after black folks are victimized by the state to build their personal wealth and prestige, pretending all along that they are acting on behalf of the masses. All of these stunts are distractions meant to confuse our people about what liberation truly is. They create illusions of forward movements, of progress towards freedom when in reality they are reactionary, counter-revolutionary projects. Our responsibility as organizers is to distinguish what we are fighting for 
from these reforms and attempts to depoliticize the masses of our people. This requires clarity of shared political principles. We must clarify to the masses that liberation means the destruction of capitalism, imperialism, and all other forms of exploitation. It is the unification of African people under scientific socialism. Liberation is the fight for self-determination for all oppressed people globally. That means new Africans in, in America cannot be free if our brothers and sisters outside of the US are also not free. Liberation is all of our ba basic needs being met, not the hoarding of wealth in the hands of the black celebrities. Liberation requires struggle. It is not a quest for luxury or a soft life or, pro or a promotion into a senior management at a Fortune 500 company. And it is something we must fight to take. It will not be handed to us by friendly politicians or benevolent billionaires with good hearts, quote unquote. <laughs> we must offer these political principles, the reality of our struggle to the masses so we can begin to reassert what our contemporary revolutionary struggle is about. It is only with these clear definitions and political principles that we can begin to organize our people away from reactionary state responses born from our growing awareness of the contradictions all around us and toward the true fight for self-determination. And it is only through shared unity around these principles that we'll be equipped to build a large enough movement to contend with the strength and unity of our enemies. Contending with our primary enemies, the state, the capitalist class, and their servants, the black political misleadership class, the petty bourgeois managerial class, and the black celebrities that give them cultural relevance will require a highly organized and disciplined movement. We must have clarity that these are not our allies, they are our enemies. Furthermore, we must recognize that our enemies are not smarter than us. They are not more skilled than we are. However, they have created entire systems and institutions that function to maintain their control of capital, of land, and of people. They have adapted their tactics over time based on changing societal conditions from primitive capitalism to imperialism and neocolonialism, from segregation to the development of the black middle buffer class to black figurehead presidents and other politicians to administer the empire. And they have, for the most part, been coordinated and intentional in these projects of domination. For us to overcome them, for us to organize the masses of the people into formations well poised to challenge these systems, we must be disciplined and committed. There is no such thing as a part-time revolutionary. The work, this work is too important to do casually or inconsistently. If we do, we will not win. As the masses of our people struggle to survive, to have a roof over our heads, to feed ourselves and our families, to stay safe from the police and intracommunal violence resulting from our deprivation, it is our task as organizers to demonstrate that we can organize and then fight our way out of that oppression. Our people will not believe this possibility though if we are sloppy and lazy. If we, do, if we don't show up on time, if we don't execute programs and campaigns that are strategic and organized, if we don't create robust and consistent pipelines that bring the masses into our formations to capitalize on the mistrust our people already have for the state and its institutions that exploit and abandon us, we have to model an alternative. We must develop ongoing programs that feed, clothe, house, arm, organize and politically develop our people on a frequent and regular basis. We must be present in real life, knocking on doors, bringing new people into this work, developing them into principled leaders along the way. We must study so that we can refine and adapt our organizing practices as conditions change. We must be nimble enough to try and do strategies if our old ways of doing things stall or fail. Mastering these iterative processes is time consuming and requires deep strategy. And to do this organizing work well, we have to be serious about it. We have to uphold our commitments to build trust among comrades and within our communities. We have to be reliable so that our people will take us seriously and want to invest in the collective vision 
of liberation. If we are asking our people to sacrifice their all too limited time, energy, and resources in pursuit of this revolutionary struggle, we must lead by example. This means showing up even if we are tired, sticking, in our move, st sticking to our movement principles even when it would be easier to take a different liberal or reformist route, committing ourselves to personal po political education as a regular and consistent hobby, using every feasible opportunity and interaction to build our people into this work. The discipline re required is a commitment to living a life dedicated to our people and our struggle. We cannot win with anything else or with anything less. To be clear, this discipline will not be easy. It will also require discomfort. It will require calling out contradictions in our own organizations and among comrades. It will require, as Mao has taught us, combating liberalism. We must confront com confront conflict in ways that uphold our principles and commitments to one another, not by succumbing to petty gossip or ignoring real issues to protect personal relationships or avoid awkwardness. To advance our struggle, we have to be willing to accept principled criticism and call each other in when we see our comrades straying from our shared commitments and political principles. And we must do this in a way that is centered on political advancement, not personal attacks. And we must do this in a way that is centered on, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we must receive principled criticism without deflection or self-righteousness. Upholding these values is one way to embody our individual commitment to driving our struggle forward and to buffer against our attempts by outside forces or unprincipled people to distract us from our objectives. Because liberalism is a culturally dominant ideology in our society, we have to remain vigilant and in in identifying its presence. Are we allowing people in our organizations who make poor choices and allow them to remain in order to maintain personal friendships? Are we ignoring conflict because it's easier to just keep our head down and do the work? Are we creating conflict out of personal vendettas instead of attempts to reach better political clarity and alignment? Are we isolating ourselves in small networks pontificating about lofty, lofty political topics for self-glorification or to make ourselves seem smarter instead of engaging with the masses of our people. To ensure we can answer no to all of these questions, we must create institutionalized processes for offering criticism, receiving criticism, and navigating conflicts. We have to engage in these practices and not just accept them as ideals. Creating and acting on these values may be messy and uncomfortable work, but our commitment to liberation will help us overcome the parts that are hard because we know that freedom is worth it. And we are lucky because we do not have to figure out how to combat liberalism or remain disciplined or create unity around political principles from scratch. We are fortunate to have with us, even at this conference, many movement elders who have spent their lives embedded in liberation struggles. These elders can advise us on both best practices and pitfalls to avoid. We can learn from their wisdom, adapting historical lessons to our contemporary context. So I encourage everyone to use this time together to build connections with each other. Those here that can help guide and refine the piece of the work your commitment, you're committing your life to. Unity will not just come from shared principles, it will require trust and ongoing relationships between all of us engaging in struggle. So between panels, during workshops, and after the activities of each day wrap up, spend time getting to know each other. Brainstorm ways we can link our projects together and catalyze progress towards the liberation of New Africa and Pan-Africanism. Discuss the challenges your organization are facing and ask for insights from those that may have notice of solutions. It is not every day that we can share space with each other, so I encourage everyone to make the most of it. I look forward to spending the rest of these next two days with you all. I hope you all enjoy the conference as well. Peace.
My name is Sean. And um, I'm also part of the conference planning committee. And I would like to extend my welcome to you too on behalf um, of CMB and um, the conference planning committee. And also because I'm an artist, I'd also like to extend my welcome via a song. Um, this is a song I wrote, it's called My House. And it has themes of revolutionary love and working class experience. So um, I'd like to do that for y'all, but I'm gonna need a little help y'all. I'm gonna need a little help with this song. Um, I'm gonna need y'all to help me keep the beat. Y'all think y'all can do that, black people? Okay, I kind of figured, you know. Um, but I'm gonna get into the song, so y'all just feel it, and we'll just we'll just flow, okay? So it goes like this. Ain't got no house to call my own. I'm living check to check my apartment small but it's a home where i can lay my head you're welcome any time if i come stay a little while your towel and washcloth will not match but they were laid out with a smile but i ain't got much i'll tell you and life's been tough can i get a witness but i got love i got it so you got love yeah there ain't no crystal stay around here nothing to keep pristine so let's fill this home with love and cheer and don't worry about petty things we ain't promised not one more day we ain't promised one minute more, so let's look upon each other's face and realize what we're here for, but I ain't got much, I tell ya, and life's been tough, can I get a witness, but I got love. I got it, so you got love. Wait a minute, wait a minute, stop the beat for a second. Cause here comes the bridge and it slows down. Listen, there's gonna be beans and rice in here on a regular basis. My clothes are from the thrift store, otherwise I'd be making. Got my bookshelf by the dumpster of my old apartment complex. Ain't it something that what I'm grateful for? Some folks call garbage. Here we go, here we go. My words not in how much I own. So don't confuse me with my circumstances. I said the door is open to my home. The door is open. Yes, it is. But I ain't got much. I tell you, and life's been tough. It make me wanna holler, but I got love. I got it, so you got love. Yeah, but I ain't got much. I tell you, and life's been tough. It makes me wanna holler, but I got love. I got it, so you got love. Wait a minute. I'm gonna seal in the juices, y'all. I'm gonna do this last part by myself, okay? Well, I ain't got much. 
now in life's winter. It makes me wanna hurt but I, I got love. So come here, some love. I said, love that revolutionary. Love, love. Thank you. So I got a few little housekeeping notes, y'all, before we get into the plenary. Um, just real quick, um, security, security. On the security tip, y'all, if you have any um, questions or concerns um, about security, Kwame was just up here. You can speak with him and anyone else you see doing security. We need to wear our wristbands all the time because that's also a security measure. We want to make sure people who are up in here are supposed to be up in here. Um, also, do not bypass the check-in table. We need to check you in, um, you know, as you come in and even as you go out. We're just trying to, um, you know, be real careful about security. Um, some general, general conference stuff. You can come to me. Tunde, are you in the room? Tunde, Tunde, Coco, who was um, here last night. If you were here, there's Coco, another part of the um, conference planning committee. If you guys have any general conference questions, you can come go to Coco. You can come to me. You can go to Tunde. Um, in terms of the plenaries and workshops, I just want y'all to know, um, especially folks on the um, plenaries, we'll be in, in the workshops. We're going to have some timekeepers holding up signs just to help us, you know, stay on time as much as possible. So you'll see like 15 minutes left, time's up. So just observe those signs so we can try to keep on time. Um, in terms of dining, um, just so you know, we have some, as you can see, some volunteers working. If the line gets really long, we might need to prioritize the volunteers getting some food so they can return to their shift. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, parents, of course, will be picking up their children at meal times. Just a reminder about that. And um, you know, for today and tomorrow, anyone who's willing to volunteer to make plates for any of our community members who need assistance in that way, you know, there's a table where you can congregate, and there are some um, resources there where you can help folks who might um, need that assistance. Hold on for a second. Um, and Coco just reminded me that today um, you should have a black wristband on. So that's what folks will be checking for, um, your black wristband. OK. OK, I think that's all that I have for these little housekeeping announcements. We're going to get set up for our first plenary today. Um, that's called Movements in Motion. So um, we're going to get that started.
What it do, black people? It's always a great day to be black, right? Okay. So my name is Amber Sherman. This is the Movements in Motion Plenary. My check. Check. So the challenge for building an effective, independent, black radical movement has never been more apparent than today. As the ruling elite is in complete disarray because of the ongoing and deepening capitalist crisis, Joe Biden's neoliberal project would not be able to reverse the crisis in black and other colonialized communities, as well as among the general working class. Community movement builders see the challenge as building structures and structures and institutions that consolidate independent black working class power that protect our interests, while the US state increasingly relies on the repression and war to maintain dominance of the colonial capitalist system. This discussion will tackle the political, cultural, and organizational challenges we face in attempting to develop new resistance structures that meet the demands of the moment. As I said before, my name is Amber Sherman. I'm a member of the official Black Lives Matter Memphis chapter, as well as community movement builders. I'm going to introduce our panelists, starting at the far end. So first we have Abbas Mutakin. He's a Muslim New African educator, cultural worker, and organizer. He's the co-founder of People's Program, an Oakland-based New African Pan-African organization. He co-hosts Hella Black Podcast and is the creator of Tales of the Sound. He also co-founded the Fannie Lou Hamer Black Resource Center at UC Berkeley and has taught African-American studies there for about five years. He's also a producer and host at Press TV, and Abbas follows an Islamic African tradition that calls for the liberation of all Africans and oppressed people. Kwame Olobini is the Cooperative and Security Director for Community Movement Builders. He's led an anti gentrification petition campaign, collecting over 400 signatures, and as part of this campaign, he helped organize a forum with community members discussing the history of gentrification in Atlanta and what residents can do to ensure they are able to stay in their homes. Kwame has also led and organized several anti-police brutality murder protests and helped start and run a mutual aid program for the Southwest Atlanta community, providing COVID-19 relief and funds so legacy residents can pay their bills amid gentrification. Next is Jordan McGowan. He's a founder, chair, and serves as the Minister of Programs for Neighbor Programs. He holds degrees in political science, African American studies, and a master's in education. After a short career as a professional athlete, he began his career as an educator, teacher, and coach in Sacramento. He also taught grades for third through twelfth while being a guest lecturer at UC Berkeley, Sacramento State, Sacramento City College, and various K-12 schools. Jordan views his recent work in film through the lens of creating revolutionary educational content modeled after the Black Panthers and their propaganda team. Born in West Philadelphia, Akimba Mulata Azure is a passionate educator and community organizer, as well as a member of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement and the African People, People's Socialist Party. He's a full time professor at Megar Evers College and is taught at St. John's University. We get a hand clap for our amazing panelists. So first I just want to give each panelist a, a chance to do um, a quick kind of introduction, opening statement, starting with Abbas. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, it's definitely an honor and privilege to be here, be here in the land in the Republic of New Africa. I was able to get here a little bit early and visit my, my grandma's hometown in Marshallville, Georgia for the first time. Uh, you know, I'm coming uh, from Oklahoma, I co-chair People's Programs, and we run a various uh, decolonization programs with the objective of freeing the land from Euro-American control. So coming back here and being in the land and, and visiting my grandma's hometown, that was like a, a certain spiritual connection for me, because we have to know our own history uh, and the own reasons why we is fighting the freedom land. And making that connection to history is super important. So in Oakland, what we have is a various amount of decolonization programs. So the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, they have survival programs pending revolution. Julian Mutaki, he advocated in his book, We Are Our Own Liberators, to evolve past survival programs and to move to decolonization programs. 
right? We don't have merely just the right to survive. We have the right to go on to the offensive for new African liberation. That is our human right. If we understand the genocide that is going on day in and day out, we have the right to free the land. And how do we free the land is the real question. How do we develop the proper ideological uh, structure and thought process? Because if we don't have the right thoughts, we sure as hell ain't gonna have the right actions, right? For us, so what we're doing is building material programs in the heart of Oakland. If we don't have programs, if we don't have infrastructure, if we don't, if we aren't trying to build this nation, how are we going to move toward revolution? So we have a free breakfast program in Oakland. We fed over 60,000 meals in the past six years. We have a, a free grocery program as well in West Oakland. That serves Acorn Projects, which is the high-rise uh, projects in, in West Oakland. Uh, we have a free community health clinic in West Oakland as well. Uh, literally a clinic on wheels, you know. I'll be driving that clinic. It's pretty big. I'll be, I'll be swerving it through local, you know what I'm saying, with the potholes, dodging the potholes and dodging the police. Um, so we see these programs as offensive in nature, right? It draws out the contradictions of capitalism because when our people see us in our community, feeding the people, supporting the community, uh, building with the community, it exposes the nature of capitalism. Why is it that us, why is it that we are in the heart of our community doing the work? <laughs> and the state is getting paid to do what? Do we think Joe Biden is gonna save us? Do we think Kamala Harris is gonna save us? Do we think Barack Obama is gonna save us? But we, the people, if we show the people that we can build power through our institutions that we is building through these institutions, we can't get free. We gotta believe that, right? So having that infrastructure, that autonomous infrastructure in the heart of our community is how we build national unity. If we don't have national unity, we ain't going nowhere. It exposes the decadent nature of neocolonialism because how are we gonna have national unity when we got these black cops doing what they do? How are we gonna have national unity when we have these neo-colonialists who use the language of abolition, use the language of revolution, but ain't about that action? So we see the material base of our force is our program, is these decolonization programs, and we have to have a clear objective. If we was trying to get to this place where we at right now, we ain't gonna put in Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> If we try to get to Atlanta, we ain't gonna put Montgomery, Alabama. So we have to have a clear objective of freeing the land. And we also know that freeing the land here is not enough. We have to unify with the Pan-Africanist struggle. But we here as New Africans, we have the right to be free. Why don't we? We have the right to govern ourselves. If we understand ourselves as a colonized nation, we have the right to free ourselves from Euro-American control. That is our human right. And the way we do that uh, through people's programs is put it into organizations have a material force. I could talk all the time, but judge me based off the program. Judge me about the amount of meals we fed, about how much health care we provided to people. That's how I started to judge me. So I appreciate everybody for being here. That's all I'm Nissa, we have Kwame. I forgot to mention you have five minutes. Peace, everybody. I'm gonna keep it short. Um, I'm I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to, to see everybody in here. I'm really excited for us to be able to collectively build some political clarity and also collectively build some organizational clarity. Um, right now, this topic you see up on the screen is about movements in motion. I think that's an aptly named discussion for how we have to liberate ourselves. The tactics that were employed in past revolutionary moments are not the same tactics that we have to employ today. We have to learn from the past. We have to learn from the uh, revolutionary successes all across the African diaspora. We have to learn about uh, the revolutionary moments of even non-African revolutions that took place all across this world. However, those tactics that were employed at that point are not the same tactics that we have to employ for our own particular struggle here. We also have to recognize that our movement is not a singular isolated movement. Just like global, just like capitalism, imperialism, racism, patriarchy, patriarchy, heteropatriarchy are international, so too has our uh, praxis has to also be international. We have to recognize that while all politics are local, all politics are also international. Right. We have to recognize that when we are doing the work to liberate ourselves, that causes vibrations all across the world. So I'm here today while we think about this at the macro level, we also have to recognize that 
when we're our actual organizing takes place on a personal level. Organizing takes place by individual conversations, those door knocks, those one on ones with residents, those porch sit conversations. That's what builds the actual movement to bring people who are uh, lost right into a revolutionary moment. When we build a, when we build a culture, we talk about building a revolutionary culture. That culture is built through struggle. When we talk about struggle, we're talking about struggling against the states and this imperialist empire that is affecting us at every one of our homes, right? So when we talk about our liberation, we're talking about both on a very personal level, how are we connecting with our neighbors? How are we connecting with the communities we're organizing within? And how are we connecting that struggle to the larger structures that are colonizing us here locally in um, this US of A and also <laughs> all across the world? Thank you. Sorry. Peace and whatever you are. I appreciate community movement builders for having us out here. Um, I want to give a special shout out to the Malcolm X Academy Babies uh, Neighbor Program as a Pan African organization. They're my black and the Black Panthers um, and their community programs. We currently operate 15 programs um, from what we would call survival programs to decolonization programs. We try to have a spectrum of like where are we really at, right? If we are giving people their basic needs, they are just surviving, right? If we are teaching them the farm, teaching them the could grow their own food if they're if the babies are in school like that is decolonizing right so like those are the programs we hit around and we have 15 from our building in uh, the oak park neighborhood in sacramento oak park is significant um, for multiple reasons one because that's where the Panther office was in sacramento served as a unifying force for the africans in the city and the destruction of that that branch has led to the music and the culture that has permeated our city which is a lot of intercommunal violence. So for us, it's really important to be back there um, and building these programs, right? Uh, with a name like the Shakur Center, right? People obviously know Pop, right? But we're able to uh, bring them in the rest of the Shakur family, right? Through that, through that name. So again, we have free groceries, a health and wellness clinic, a legal clinic. Um, I mean, our, our, our favorite, our prized possession is our, our school. We have a, a homeschool. We have 15 students there we call Malcolm X Academy for African Education. Um, little babies get to farm, they get to cook, they get to, you know, love each other, learn to love each other. That's what's real, and that's uh, the most beautiful thing about it. Um, again, I would say we're not a, we're not a. It's it's really dope to be here and to see so many orgs and to see so many people. Because I'm going to be so honest, our team is really small in Sacramento, right? Like the political consciousness of our city is very different than of an Atlanta, of a, of a Oakland, right? And so. Um, to that point, being able to connect with y'all and take those tactics from everywhere and see how those can fit into our locale and how we can adjust those to make it make sense to our community um, is really important. And I hope that something that we share, um, that what we do, the neighbor program at the Shakur Center is valuable to you and y'all struggle there. Um, but again, we know essentially that we have to get into the community. Our name is neighbor program because we want to be a good neighbor, right? And so. We go door to door, we, we knock on those doors. And so I, I think about uh, the conversations I would have last night and um, Jihad reminding us to, to start to really get back into that, right? Knowing each other. And that's our nature as Africans, right? To live in a communal fashion. And so that's what we're trying to build uh, in Sacramento. We're trying to build that collective African consciousness so that we can have unity because we are so divided in our city. Um, so that's what we're doing. And again, I hope something that um, I say today is hopeful for y'all, and I hope to learn from y'all, and I appreciate y'all having me. Uh, Uhuru. Um, Uhuru means freedom. I, you know, I thought everybody might have known that. I'll say it again. Uhuru. Right, free to land. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Ikemba. I'm a member of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. Um, and African People's Socialist Party. So I, I do want to acknowledge uh, our leadership, Chairman Omali Yashatela, uh, as well as the, uh, the National Central Committee. Uh, I am here representing the organization. I think it's important for me to say that. You know, I'm not here uh, just as an individual. I'm a part of a larger organization and movement. 
Um, so it, with, with that being said, I think it's important um, that we do have these conversations. I'm happy to be in the room uh, full of organizers. My intention uh, was to come down here and sort of uh, present a, a plan of action. Only had five minutes, so uh, you know, hopefully there'll be another uh, opportunity to to present that in more detail. Um, there is something though that I wanted to read uh, really quick uh, from Martin Delaney's um, uh, at the Color Convention. Martin Delaney's uh, political uh, destiny to the people. Sorry, pull that up. But I'm I'm going to read that in the 1850s there were. Uh, color conventions taking place and during this time because of the height and contradiction in America many of our people uh, understood that we're not citizens in America uh, there was orbit people like Henry Highland Garnett Martin Delaney uh, they would create organizations like the African Civilization Society uh, and if you read some of these documents they were even talking about building an African nation African Empire in in the 1850s um, so this isn't uh, nothing new. We're part of this long tradition of black nationalism, uh, of separating ourselves from colonial capitalism. Um, so I'm gonna have to put my glasses on to read though. Um, so really quick, I just, I think it's important to hear what Delaney was saying. And this is in 1854. Um, he said to the color inhabitants of the United States, uh, fellow countrymen, the duty assigned to us is an important one, comprehending all that pertains to our destiny and that our, post and that, uh, and that our posterity present and prospectively. And while it must be admitted that the subject is one of the greatest magnitude requiring all the talents, prudence, and wisdom might adduce, and while it would be folly to pretend to give you the combined result of these, uh, of these three agencies, we shall satisfy ourselves with doing our duty to the best of our ability, and that is, and that in the plainest, most simple and comprehensive manner. Our object then shall be to place before you our true position in this country, the United States, and the improbability of realizing our desires and the sure, practical, and infallible remedy for the evils we now endure. We have, we have not addressed you as citizens, a term desired and ever cherished by us, because such have never been. We have not addressed you as freemen because such privileges have never been enjoyed by any colored man in the United States. Why then should we flatter you, flatter your credulity by inducing you to believe that which neither has now nor never before had in existence? Our oppressors are ever grateful at our manifest satisfaction, especially when that satisfaction is founded upon false premises, an assumption on our part on the, of the enjoyment of rights and privileges which we never have been conceded and which according to the present system of the United States policy, we never can enjoy. Um, and I think like, these delusions uh, still exist today. We've never been, never will be citizens or should we desire to even be citizens of the United States of America. So with that being said, I know I'm in a room with people who share that same sentiment Right, but I think there's a lot that we need to do more of as organizations. This is about unity. Last year, um, I'm also a member of We Charge Colonialism. We, we're a media platform right now. And we held a, a, a conference, and some of you may have been part of that, uh, Pan-African Unity or Parish. And so this has really been you know, the theme for, for the last you know, few years. We're understanding the importance of organizations crossing ideological lines and coming together and building this united front to overcome colonial capitalism, which is an international, you know, struggle, not just a national struggle. Um, so the last, <laughs> the last thing um, I want to say, I probably don't even have time for this, but all right, all right, thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna get into the discussion questions. Um, what are some of the key challenges you and your organization are facing in building independent Black political power? Black political power. Yeah, so uh, many of the challenges, especially now, it's always the state overcoming the state, um, you know, oppression, uh, repression is always a challenge. Um, recently, many of you may know, you know organizational office, organization offices have been raided by the, by the FBI, uh, which is the, the, the government. Um, so the government has raided our offices and our leadership 
is now, you know, fighting for their freedom. And in America, the fight for Uhuru, the fight for freedom has always been illegal. You know, you can ask Gabriel Pasa, Nat Turner, you know, these, you know, the same thing, you know, and their struggle for freedom, right? Um, and so we're still dealing with that, dealing with state uh, oppression. Um, and that's something I'm gonna ask, you know, that everybody uh, support the hands off Uhuru campaign as we continue to deal with that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, other struggles uh, that we have is always, um, you know, in, internal, internal struggles dealing with liberalism as we were spoken about before. Uh, many people come into uh, organization and, and um, you know, democratic centralism is a hard thing for many people to align with. Uh, so many of us may, you know, talk about liberalism and how liberalism can destroy organizations but how many of us can really like submit to the will, you know, the organization and the people and, and put the movement before our individual needs. Um, so it's easier said, um, said in theory than in practice. Um, so that's been a struggle, but throughout all the struggles though, we still have been able to like really build black power. If you look at the uh, black power blueprint and see what's taking place in St. Louis, uh, you know, there's a lot of, we build a basketball court. We got the uh, Uhuru, uh, health center, women's health center um, out there. We have over 50 economic institutions. So we are building black power. Um, Philadelphia, where I'm at, we have the, uh, the One Africa, One Nation Marketplace, which is also in St. Louis, out there in California, Oakland. I think some, someone mentioned Oakland. Um, so we, you know, it's always going to be a struggle to liberate ourselves, but you know, we've been enduring and we're you know, building. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to add, you have two minutes to answer, uh, Jordan. Um, what I would say is our biggest struggle, um, because we're fighting the state, right? Um, and we're in the state capital, right? So you think like, oh, y'all, stones throw away from the Bay, right? Like the culture would translate, but it doesn't, right? Most people move to the state capital to take a state job, to take a county job. So if you depended upon that, it's hard to fight that system, right? And so in Sacramento specifically, we're fighting, a, uh, you know, to really bring about an African consciousness. And what that also looks like is people then don't support, right? They don't understand the need for Malcolm X Academy. They don't understand the need. Why are y'all giving out 600 boxes of groceries a month? Because niggas are starving and dying in the street, right? They have no idea that, like, we should be caring that someone is getting arrested or that someone's things are being stolen. They're like, oh, well, that's just... That's just what happens. Well, you know, we need the we need the homelessness clone cleaned up. But what it is, it's just a, a lack of consciousness of what's really happening. There's no understanding of that we are at war, right? Um, there's too much assimilation. So that is like the biggest thing that we are facing, right? In in Sacramento, at least, right? Is this this idea that we could go along and get along and everything will be all right? You know what I'm saying? And so for us. Um, that again, that translates into everywhere, right? It, it translates into the numbers of members that ha we have. It translates into uh, the dollars coming in that support the programming that we have. It comes into how many people are showing up uh, when we have, because we have a clinic as well, right? And we have providers. So how many providers are showing up on that day, right? How many legal resources are pulling up? Because it's, a, it's an understanding of what is necessary. So that is the biggest thing that we're fighting Right, and then obviously funds, right, to keep going because anytime you say you African or you got a Black Panther or anything with that, right, uh, those dollars are slow to come in, right? It's, it's, it's all of a sudden scary, it's risky, right? The day we signed the lease to our building, we lost $35,000 because of the name Malcolm X Academy, right? They're like, nah, that name's too risky. So, so those things, right, have a, a direct impact on how we're able to serve and how we're able to um, show up for the people. And so um, creating that consciousness of why this is important, why it is vital, why we are supporting and, and, and you know, building into this fight, because essentially um, all of us here are out, you know, we're, we're stepping into that war, right? And we need bullets, whatever that looks like, right? And whether that's money to pay the bills, to have a building, whether that's right, to keep someone out of jail, whether that's food, right? We need those things. If we're at war, we need the necessary tools uh, to be able to liberate our people. And so that's what we're facing. Thank you, Jordan. 
as a reminder, two minutes. You have two minutes. Kwame, go ahead. All right, two minutes. <laughs> All right, so um, I'll try to keep it short. So I think I'll, I'll, cut, I'll break it down into two different categories. Um, the first category I think that we uh, struggle with is, well, I'll take three categories, I'm sorry. So the first category I think we struggle with is uh, the climate that we organize within here in Atlanta. Again, with Community Movement Builders in the Atlanta chapter, um, we are what a lot of people envision as being the quote unquote black Mecca, right? We have, we're in a situation where we have black mayors, black city council, we have black police officers, we've had black police chiefs, we've had all these Africans that are holding the role of the colonizer. And so breaking through to a lot of people that just because something is black, doesn't necessarily translate to this as a liberation, right? So that's definitely a cloud that we have to break through with a certain segment of people, right? And a certain segment of people that we're organizing within. However, there's another segment of people that they honestly don't care who it is that's in the seat, but they also, but they do know that their needs are not being met, right? And so that's, you know, you might think that's an easier way to be able to get through to, to people, right? And in some ways it is, but it's also a struggle to be able to make sure that people have the capacity to be able to organize. So when we uh, think through the, the many different layers of being able to break through with community members to be able to bring folks from, um, you know, we have a liberation program where we distribute free groceries, cleaning supplies, hygiene items, um, in that type of, in mutual aid type of format, paired with political education, right? You might have a lot of people that are willing to receive these items, but the numbers when you try to bring them into the room to be able to have that political education that's paired with it might start to dwindle, right? And so we have to think critically and think um, creatively about how we're having those conversations with people, how we're bringing this in is like, no, this is not just another charity program. We're not trying to start another welfare program but we're actually trying to utilize this tool as a mechanism to build collective power. And it works, right? It works. We have brought several folks into our organization um, who started off with uh, liberation programs to starting to be organizers in our community, right? It, it, it's a model that works, but it's also a model that takes a lot of time and a lot of, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, one-on-one -on -one building with people to be able to make sure folks are actually plugged into the work. So um, I only said one of the three, or two of the three, but I'm going to leave it there because I know I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> two minutes. Yes. Neil, come on, Elizabeth. That, that is our, our biggest obstacle at this moment, right? Neo colonialism meaning the integration of the colonized people into the colonial system to do the work of the colonizers, giving all the outward trappings of quote unquote freedom, quote unquote independence but still we in chains, just a different type of chain, right? So for us, especially in Oakland, I say Oakland in many ways is kind of the capital of the nonprofit industrial complex. It's the capital of using these words like revolution, like liberation, all these buzzwords, but behind it, what you have is what is being used by the state as a containment strategy. So they'll use these neo-colonial actors using these big words, but what they'll actually do is funnel the people into the Democratic Party. So we say words like end homelessness, We'll send, say words like end imperialism. We'll say we need to build power. But then in reality, what is happening is they're being funneled into the Democratic Party. They're being funneled into an endorsement for a Zionist imperialist named Bernie Sanders. And they're trying to repeat the same program over and over and over again. So I say neo-colonialism neo is fighting against that, but also I say we're our biggest, our biggest enemy. We got to change what's within our own hearts with what's in our own soul, change what's within ourselves if we claim to be a revolutionary. I had to do that myself. I'm running around calling myself a revolutionary, but I'm an alcoholic. I'm almost two years sober. So I had to have that struggle, uh, the internal revolution, that uh, internal jihad with myself to struggle against myself to become the best person that I can be. Because what good is waging a revolution if there's still terrible people after? So we gotta change the condition that within our hearts, within our soul, to evolve from a species or a thing like Fanon calls us into dignified human beings. Because how can we claim we human beings when we still fight for human rights? 
I agree a lot, especially with the uh, breaking up. I think about the breaking up with the cup in your head um, as you start becoming an abolitionist. So I think it's one of the first key steps. Um, and we're gonna start with you, Abbas, with this next question. What are the prospects for uniting our struggles for the future that we seek? We have two minutes, and then we have a time to go right here at the front. So we're gonna raise their hand. Oh, oh yeah, it's what are the prospects for uniting our struggles for the future that we seek? I would say the conditions are either going to force us to unite or we're going to make the willing choice to unite. I prefer that we make the willing choice to unite because these conditions that they force us to unite under these conditions, we won't have the foundation post the condition, post whatever we are experiencing, right? So I think it's important that we uh, unify our ranks and we unify our ranks also with the proper ideology. If we don't have the proper ideology, we ain't going to go in the right direction, right? So what you will uh, argues is we need to create the uh, front on the front for the liberation of the new African nation. We have to have united cadres all throughout the so-called United States of America with three Ks. We have to have united cadres in every locale where new Africans are, everywhere where we are, and build decolonization programs. And through that collective force of unifying, of developing national unity, then we can see, okay, we have some national unity. Okay, we can govern ourselves. Why are we complaining that we ain't even governing ourselves? Why are we complaining, but we don't even have the aspiration to govern ourselves? So we must uh, develop this positive force, being fro on and move towards freeing the land from Euro-American control. If we don't have that positive force in our community, if we don't have that infrastructure in our community, we're just playing games. We can't talk about nation building, but we don't have a program to show for it. So we must unite uh, in this room like, to actually build a movement. Because do we actually have a movement right now? Look at the conditions of our people. People in the streets sleeping, houseless. Neighborhoods being decimated. Gentrification, genocide. We is losing the war, so when are we gonna choose? When are we gonna make that active choice amongst these people in this room that we is gonna unify? We're gonna get over our petty disagreements. We're gonna say, I see you as a human being. I see your right to life. I see, I want you for, I want for myself, but I want for you. If I want housing for myself, I want that for everybody else. I want water for myself, I want water for everybody else. If I want food for myself, I want food for everybody else. So once we uh, evolve ourselves and see ourselves as a new type of human being, ultimately that's what can unite us. That will be our united force, inshallah. Yo, plus one to everything that Abbas just said. I think he took the words in a lot of ways right out of my mouth. Um, the only thing I'll add on to that is um, I agree with what he said as far as, you know, we're going to either be forced to <laughs> unify because look, y'all, 2024 is coming and whether it's a Democrat or Republican that is elected into office, we see the fascism on the rise, right? On the ground, organizers are seeing the fascism on the rise. We see here in Atlanta, domestic terrorism being thrown out for holding up signs that say stop cop city, right? 35 years sentences of uh, possibility being thrown up because you're holding up a sign. We see people getting raided into their house, homes with SWAT without any kind of firearms in the middle of the night for holding a solidarity fund, right? Uh, holding a, a fund to uh, get people for bail support, right? We see, and this is under democratic leadership, right? Um, we see the fascism already here. And so, with whatever the uh, turnout is, it's going to energize the white supremacist on even more, whatever the turnout is, so that we have to be prepared because that's coming. Um, and that by itself hopefully will unify us. And even if it doesn't, we'll have to unify ourselves ideologically. So I think that um, when we talk about our organizations, our cadres, we have to be able to have a foundation of ideological struggle to when we are engaging with one another, right? When we start having partnerships and we start building out this uh, uh, national front, um, we have to be able to engage each other with a political struggle. We have to be able to engage each other on ideology, see what things that we can uh, agree upon to be able to push that work forward because the work has to be pushed forward because we recognize what's up against us. We recognize not just what's coming, but where we are right now um, and the conditions of, of our people right now. So it's gonna be a requirement for us to be uh, unified, um, and it's just going to become more and more apparent why that requirement is uh, a necessity.
Um, I just want to go back over the question, what is, what are the prospects for uniting our struggle? And I think, um, I also, I'm an adjunct professor at America. Played message to the grassroots, right? And Malcolm is talking about the Bundung Conference, right? And he's talking about pushing the white folks out. He talks, you know, he talks in depth about this, right? And getting together, going behind closed doors, having this conversation. I think that, right, this is, is that step. Right, I think that um, also we have to be clear in the understanding that like some of us won't go. There's house niggas that don't need to come with us or don't need to fight or we don't need to unite with. We can have patience with them. We can try to bring them in. But at some point, hey, like you're not with us. And I think we have to be really clear in that as well, right? Um, we we need to have a common enemy, and some of our skin folk don't have that same common enemy. Their common enemy is us as well, because we poor, because we ghetto, because whatever they want to say it is, right? Because we wear our hair this way. Oh, y'all niggas want to be Africans, and whatever it is, right? Whatever it is, sometimes they don't. They don't, they're not going to unite with us. So I think that we have to realize who's. Who's on our on our team? Who's on our tribe? You know what I mean? Who's our part of our village, our people, our tribe? And then say, we're gonna unify on those common things that we have together, that we are African, that we have a common enemy, that we wanna see everyone have land, bread, housing, food, right? Because again, maybe you call yourself uh, a new African, maybe this person calls themselves an African, maybe this person calls them, whatever you wanna call yourself or whatever, we should all be free. Free to call yourself what you want, free to leave, live where you want, and that can only come with a united and strong Africa that's going to allow us to have that base, right? And not everyone can come in that. So I think that we have to be clear about who are we uniting with, right? And why are we uniting? And then realizing, like, it is time for us to come together. Yeah. Great points, Jordan. Um, I just want to say I called somebody a house nigga at a city council meeting last month, and you were the sore. I just I cussed them out. But I'm so glad someone agrees with me because he was a house nigga doing the work at the plantation and he needs to know that. Um, yeah, yeah, call it out, call it out. You repeat the question? I'm, I'm, a, light, I'm a lot more nicer with, with them, but we need, yeah, we need people to call it out. Yeah, the neo colonialists need to be called out. Um, uh, really quick, no, I, I got the question. I, I think. Now, what, what I have been, and I don't know if it's my level of consciousness, but I've been seeing a lot more unity, um, a lot more coalition building, uh, Black Alliance of Peace, Black is Back Coalition. Um, even with the conferences, I was part of a, a, a radical Black conference last year that I sat in on. Um, uh, and of course, like We Charge Colonialism, where we had uh, dignitaries from the continent, organizations from the continent, as well as here. Uh, coming together to discuss these issues. Uh, what, one of the problems, really quick before that though, I just want to read this, with, which we all should be familiar with, the FBI's right intention to keep us from uniting. Uh, the first thing they say is prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups and unity their strength, a truism that is no less valid for all this triteness. An effective coalition of black nationalist groups might be the first step toward a real mau mau. So the, the government, the FBI told you what they didn't want us to do. And so with that being said, we should know what we have to do. And they did a good job, great job at it, because when we, when we look at our movement, we always jump to the 60s, right? We don't really analyze what took place in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even though we were still organizing, we were on our hills. Um, but I think like if we, if we understand the importance of coalition building and really quick, because I know my time, I think after this conference, because one of the issues we had after we did the conference last year, is we didn't have a plan of action. So afterwards, there wasn't any building taking place. So, you know, I, I just want to encourage all of the organizations of the locally, nationally, we're, we're, many of us are part of national organizations, wherever we are, build with other organizations on the ground, create sort of like this public advocacy uh, a group for the people where we can represent the people, uh, where we can call out the local times as a collective, right? Go to these uh, community board meetings and so forth. But I think this is something practical that we can do 
in our cities, in Atlanta, in Philadelphia, in New York. In New York, we're doing it in Brooklyn. We've been really building with other organizations, organizations we've had antagonistic relationships with in the past, we're building with right now. Ooh. Thank you. So this is a longer question, so I'm gonna give y'all three minutes this time. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna read it two times because it's kind of long. What do you see as the need for and nature of revolution, revolutionary organizations and how should they participate in and relate to broader movements and what are some tensions involved with it? So one more time. What do you see as the need for and nature of revolutionary organizations how they should participate in and relate to broader movements and some tensions that could be involved in that. Blame Tunde, he wrote the questions. What do you see as the need for and nature of revolutionary organizations, how they should participate in and relate to broader movements and some tensions that could be involved in that? Starting with the kingdom. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's very much needed, right? We need a revolution, <laughs> um, the, if I'm understanding the question right. Uh, you know, revolutions come about because uh, people don't see any value in, in the system that they're part of. And um, as a people who have been colonized, African people who have been colonized, oppressed, there is no value um, in the system, colonial capitalism. And so a revolution is needed. Um, it's important to be able to connect with uh, broader movements. Uh, there's usually issues with uh, ideological differences, philosophical differences uh, that we have to overcome uh, as an organization, as organization, especially uh, revolutionary organizations. Uh, we uh, sometimes don't, do not want to compromise, nor should we like really compromise our principles, but we should be able to sit in the room and see what things that we can agree with uh, do we agree that, uh, you know, African people should be free, should be self-determined? Uh, if that's something that we can agree with, and you think about America, the United States, uh, when they sat in the room, the only difference is you had the bourgeois who was sitting in the room, and they were making the decision on what the system is going to look like uh, at the exclusion of the oppressed, at the exclusion of African people. Um, so we have to be um, able to sit in the room, be able to have a conversation about uh, what we think a system, the, the incoming or the system that we're trying to create is going to look like. And if we can agree that, you know, at the African working class uh, should be self-determined, then, you know, that's a great start. Uh, but yeah, with the broader movements though, um, you know, whether nationally, internationally, uh, one of the things that we have to be able to convey to, to uh, the masses, many people who don't understand it, it is an international struggle uh, the struggle is beyond the borders of the United States. As a matter of fact, these are colonial borders at the end of the day. And as African people, uh, we, we as African people, we've never had borders. We've never, even as enslaved people, we were crossing from a continent, country to country as enslaved people. So we never have um, been a people who've been confined, confined by borders. So just understand this international system and connect it with other oppressed and marginalized people is important. I think sometimes we don't take the the time to realize, um, or maybe the. I think one of the biggest things that we should have learned from the Panthers is the need to be really localized, right? Unfortunately, right uh, when Huey got out, right, he wanted to like control everything still, right, and like that created, along with Cointelpo, created some some rifts. And I think. The, the the need and necessity for revolutionary organizations is at the local level right and then and then from there because again you, you're in that neighborhood you're in that community you know those people those people know you like jihad said how you going to not call the police if you don't know that someone else can protect you or keep you safe right so as we build our local communities our our revolutionary organizations need to be building our us up in a local communal fashion right again getting back to our nature as africans living communally once we have that, right, we have those pockets, right, or those liberated zones or those communities that have that consciousness, then we can connect and, and build, right, and then 
that allows us to have a movement that is connected, right? Because it doesn't have to be the exact same because you know that it looks different in St. Louis than it does in Sacramento, than it does in Atlanta, than it does in Oakland. But you know that we're all working towards this broader thing of African liberation, right? And so I think that organizations really need to be focused on the local level, right? Really prioritizing what their community, what their people need, and then connecting again, learning from and building with other people. How, how are y'all doing this here? We're facing something similar. What did y'all do? This is what we did, right? And, and, and again, exchanging in communal fashion, right? In tr true African ways. Um, and I think that's how we relate and like the need for us, if I'm hitting the question right, I'm sorry, I'm keep looking at the question. Uh, it says, what are some tensions involved in this? And I think our tensions are, again, we're, we're so used to colonization, like we've been so conditioned to colonization that all of us want the national stage or want the lead or we want to be in front, our egos, all of it, myself included, right? And so we have to take that step back and realize like we are, our humanity as individuals is linked to our humanity as, 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 as a people, right? Ubuntu, right? I am because we are. And so if we start to understand that, I think that will allow us again to, um, to combat again, what we're facing because colonialism is all about rugged individualism. It's all about, you know, what you can do or how you can have freedom, right? But I think that when we start to get back to those practices, those communal ways that allows us, um, to do that and again that tension just comes because we're so conditioned to this to this western society to these values to these right um and so it's just a, a con constant con uh reconditioning of what our value system is and what is important how many need me to repeat the question are you good um if you repeat it one more time i think i got it but just some more time for clarity okay um, what do you see as the need for and nature of revolutionary organizations, how they should participate in and relate to broader movements and tensions that could be involved in that? So I think uh, my colleagues on the panel already addressed the need for revolutionary organizations. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what our positioning should be within the movement. Um, and I'll say it from my analysis, um, how I see it. Um, we should be one or two phases as it relates to the larger movement. We either should be uh, leading the larger movement as revolutionary organizations, either we're gonna be in the leadership role within the movement, or we should be critiquing the larger movement. And I wanna say that, and, and the reason why I say that is because outside of that, you, lead, you turn into being reactionary, you turn into reform, you turn into, uh, and we, we know that reform only strengthens the liberalism of the state, right? And so, um, and when I say, you know, we should be leading these movements, we're not, all, we're not gonna be come out the gate just leading uh, all the movements in the world, right? But what that means is that we have to be building with our people. That's what the work is to be a revolutionary organization. We're not leading because one, one individual or one group has things that they have the, the perfect analysis and therefore they're going to lead everybody else to, to the promised land. It's the same ideology of from the masses to the masses, right? And so we have to be building, we have to be learning, we have to be uh, in community as we're building up our programs, as we're um, you know, clarifying our political objectives with our people. And then once we have that base, we are then able to lead those movements, right? And until we're at that point, we should be criticizing the, the movements that are happening, that are, uh, and ultimately, because if it's not a revolutionary movement, it's gonna be leading towards reform, and it's gonna be leading, it's gonna be state run, right? And so we should be criticizing that and clarifying why the objectives of the reactionary movement that is principal at that time are not in the benefit of the masses of people, right? I think we have to look at the historical position that put us here. If we talk about pan-Europeanism, which is a thing, they sat around the, uh, in the Berlin conference, sat around a table and carved up Africa. It was their unity, <laughs> even though they don't all like each other and they always kind of battling each other. It was their unity that led to the position that we are in right now. The state is organized. The state is organized. The police is organized. The FBI is organized. The CIA is organized. The United States military is organized. 
So if we ain't organized, we're going to continue to be in the same position that we are in today. That's why we have to unite and we have to organize. That's, that's the foundation. There ain't no organization without revolution. There ain't no revolution without organization. We must have revolutionary organization. That is uh, the historical fact of what is needed. Revolutionary organization must also guide the people. There has to be a unity between the masses and revolutionary organization because the people ultimately make revolution. The people ultimately make revolution. We must understand that. The masses of people will always make revolution. That is the, the fact of the matter. And the organization has to move within unison within that, uh, within that dialectic, right? We also must understand our historical time where we are right now as new Africans. We want to talk about imperialism. Like Comrade George said, and we in the belly of the beast as new African people. We have a historic obligation to be able to strike it in the heart. What good is cutting off the tentacles of imperialism in Afghanistan and Iraq and Mali and whatnot, and if these tentacles regrow? That's what imperialism is. It's going to grow somewhere else. But we, as New African people, we have a historic obligation to not only to ourselves, to our ancestors, to our people, but to the rest of humanity. Because if we free ourselves here in the belly of the beast and destroy the United States of America, the whole world will have a chance at freedom. The whole world will have a chance to have freedom. So we must see this as our, uh, our historic, historical part. Let's take pride in that. Let's take pride in that, because how are we going to talk about the unification of all African people under scientific socialism if we can't organize new Africans? Do we expect Africa to be free if the United States of America still exists? So what is our experience and what is our obligation to humanity here? It is to organize. It is to organize for new African independence. It is to organize a people's war against the United States of America and to destroy Western imperialism so that humanity can evolve. And these Europeans, they need to evolve too. If they don't, we gotta have the organization and the power to be able to determine our own destiny. Uh, thank you for that, Abbas. So the next question also is very long, so I'm gonna read it twice. Uh, what are your thoughts in the tension between revolutionary organization and movement building where is the line between trying to take initiative and exercise leadership within a movement and substituting yourself for the movement? And you also get three minutes for this question, starting with the boss. I mean, tension is always going to exist. If we understand that struggle is always constant, you know, some of us are struggling to stay awake. I'm struggling to sit up, you know, so struggle is always going to be a, a constant part of our human experience. So once we accept that struggle is constant, we should look at struggle a certain type of way. Right, we should look at struggle as an inherent part of life. But the question is, how do we struggle? Are we going to struggle in a, a, a positive way uh, for positive development, or are we going to struggle in a negative way? Right, so there will always uh, be this tension, but I think for us, we must uh, realize that we, we got to unite and we can't be antagonistic to each other. Because that's what happens in the movement. Right? If we have more discipline within ourselves, more discipline within our cadres, more discipline within our organizations, the CIA and the FBI are going to have a lot harder time. So let's give them a hard time. <laughs> let's make it difficult, right? Uh, so this tension is without a doubt uh, uh, a natural part uh, of trying to build, of trying to build a movement. Um, in terms of leadership, we have to have leadership. I think this uh, liberalism will say, ah, we need a leaderless movement. What type of movement has ever been leaderless? <laughs> we need a movement filled with leaders. We need a movement filled with structure. Without structure, there ain't no nation. We just can't be running around and doing whatever we want to do, that ain't freedom. You can run around doing whatever you want, that's freedom. Freedom is land, freedom is bread, freedom is housing, freedom is having a, a dignified life as a human being. We must understand that. We must understand that. We must put that into practice through our organizing, through our organizing, because in 2020, they did a beautiful containment strategy. Sometimes you got to credit the devil for what it is. COVID-19, a lot of us was afraid to be outside. Like COVID was the scariest thing. I've seen some scarier shit than COVID, right? And what is that translated into, into organization? It's webinars, it's panels, it's Zoom panels, it's all this talk, but we aren't building cadre organizations. We aren't building amongst the people. We have nothing to show for. So what we have to do, the mission has to be build programs for decolonization. We have to build in the heartbeat of our community to address these tensions within our community. We have to serve the people we have to provide for the people, because why are the people going to care about revolution if you ain't doing nothing for them? It's just a buzzword. We got to show people that we can win. We got to show people and be billboards for the revolution. We got to show people, nah, this, it ain't just this uh, hard life. Yeah, it's hard, it's struggle, but nah, there's a beauty in the struggle. 
it's beauty in revolution. It's a beauty in dedicating your life for humanity. There's a beauty in that because that's how the spirit of being for the spirit of independence transformed from one generation to the next generation. I think when we talk about um, leadership and how do you avoid the individualism that might come with leadership, we have to think about principles again, right? We have to think about how the work that we're doing, why are we doing this work? Why is that leader doing that work? What is the intentionality? Why are they even the leader, right? Because what are they leading? Because ultimately, you know, we say from the masses to the masses, right? But ultimately, if you're not an organizer, you shouldn't be a leader. And when I say an organizer, I don't mean somebody that um, can get a bunch of other organizers to a function. I mean somebody that can get the masses of people out and mobilize the masses of people to take an action or mobilize the, uh, uh, the masses of people into a program where we're, equipping, where we're equipping our people with the tools necessary towards revolution. If you haven't been doing that, then you shouldn't be a leader, right? If you aren't actively doing that, you shouldn't be a leader. Because at the end of the day, if we're talking about what the principles of a revolution are, the revolution is dependent on the masses. So if, the, if you are removed from the masses, you can't be a leader, right? And so, um, you know, the way that I, what I would evaluate somebody is whether or not they're a leader or not within any kind of particular organization and have that clarity as to whether or not they are truly a leader within the organization as well as their connection to their community. And, what, and when I talk about their community, I'm talking about you have to literally be tied to people in our struggle, the masses of people in our struggle. If nobody knows you, then you're not a leader. <laughs> I think that one of the things we often, and again, to me, this is um, a byproduct of colonialism, right? Um, we get taught history from a very hero's perspective, right? Um, even ours, our heroes, Malcolm, Asada, you know, Sada means she who struggled, by the way, right? So again, the struggle is beautiful. It's, it's an important part of who we are. Um, but if we don't understand the reality of, of, again, being with the people, if our leaders are displaced, um, if it's all about their face, right? If it's all about them and their image, um, then, then that's where the tension happens, right? Because now you start to see a disconnect from the people. Um, but when you think about getting involved, getting in, 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 in the community, right? Um, having people know you, again, our political ideology is going to bring tension. Because you are telling someone, hey, do you know that you are captive? Telling someone that they are a captive here is hard. Like, what do you mean? I'm outside, I'm not in prison or I'm not, no, <laughs> right? And so, if we don't have those connections, if we don't have that relationship, as we start to do this work, it doesn't work out, right? And, and again, as an educator, and I'm, I'm sure I think most of us are educators, we can attest, the babies don't really learn unless they know you and they trust you and they love you and they, that's when learning happens, right? And so if there isn't that, there's going to be tension, right? If you think about a colonial school and there's a teacher like dictating down to the kids, there's no learning, there's no love, and then there's tension, right? If you don't listen, there's something that happens. So if we're moving in love, right? And like Asada said, revolution is love. So if we're moving in love, then we have a shot, right? But if we're moving out of all of the things of the world, if we're learning, moving because we want to be the leader or we know best or we, right, then we'll falter. Because we also, as a leader, have to be able to know, I did falter and I do need to defer to this person or that person or this team or these people, right? I have to hear, right? For us, 
our, our, we haven't been doing a very good job getting people out to our mobile clinic. Or I mean, not to our mobile clinic, to our health clinic, right? So we're like, yo, we're going to take our clinic and be mobile. We're going to pull up on the park where the people are at, right? And that's just, and that's not saying, oh, well, we have a space. You need to pull up. That's saying, hey, it's not working. The people aren't responding. Instead of being the leader, we're going to go where they're at. We're going to get in down with them, right? And I think that is where we resolve the tension because I'm always, I would be at the park, they'd be like, oh, why you don't come over here? And it's like, you know, y'all could come down, it's right around the corner. But it's like, you know what? To resolve this, we'll come to y'all. And I think that's something that we need to do, right? And that's really just moving in love. Yeah, I think that, you know, sometimes uh, we let our ideology get in the way of us like really connecting with the people um, Dr. Anderson Wilson, I remember one time listening to him and he, he talked about us not being so ideologically, I guess, I guess like in prison to our ideas that we can't, that we remain stagnant. Um, so, you know, I think like it's really important. I'm an African internationalist, you know, we got it by, you know, the theory and our movement and Uhuru movement of African internationalism, but we're going to come across a lot of people who aren't African internationalists. We would love them to be, right? To understand uh, the colonial contradiction and understand that we are, you know, one African people, you know, fighting to overturn uh, this relationship that we had with Europeans, right? We want everybody to think, but everybody isn't there, you know? Um, so with that being said, uh, you know, we want to be able to sustain, sustain the movement. You know, we're revolutionaries, uh, but to be able to sustain the movement, we need the people, the power is in the people. We can't just be sitting in, in a room exchanging our revolutionary ideas with each other, right? Um, nothing's gonna change that way. So, uh, you know, with that being said, the leadership, going, going to the leadership uh, uh, aspect of this question, I think it's important in the movement too that we make room for, for people who are coming in to be able to be innovative, come with their ideas. And for us who have been around for a while, <laughs> but uh, for, for some of us who have been around for a while in the organization to be open to uh, the youth or new people in general coming in with those creative ideas. Uh, but again, this goes back to the, to the stagnation. You know, we, we uh, people who will come in and they no longer actually is not, you know, stagnation. I'm going to say regression, right? Uh, we're moving, but we're moving in the wrong direction. So that's not the type of movement we want because once it's stagnant, the movement is dead. So, uh, you know, with that being said, I, I, I think it's important that, you know, everybody that's coming into organization, we're looking at them as leaders. They, they are leaders, you know, in their own way. And whatever role that they're taking on or you're taking on, you have to look at yourself as a leader in that role, you know? So if you're the secretary treasurer, I always, you know, with my comrades, I tell them, hey, make sure, you know, we want to build an office. So if you do move on, you go somewhere that the next person up, they don't have a lot of work to do, right? Because you did it all, but that's going to come from example in that position. Um, so there, there's a lot of hope, you know, you're already able to get something from that. Confluence of ideas, but I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> No, that was good. <laughs> so now we want to uh, check in with y'all. See if folks from the audience have any questions. They'd like to be ready. One second, we got a disinfectant, you know. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm Haas, I have a, um, not pretty much, I don't have a question necessarily, but I want to push back on the statement that was made by one of the panelists. I don't know who it was actually, but the statement that there's no like such thing as a part-time revolutionary. 
I don't know if you guys are familiar with the New People's Army in the Philippines, for example, or you ever watched like a Red Fish documentary on like, you know, like their movement, right, activity or whatnot. But, you know, they have part-timers who support like the full-time, you know, like revolutionaries, like in the zones, like, liberty, you know, like the liber you know, liberated zones they have in the middle of the Philippines. You gotta be honest about people's capacity when coming into like organization, you know what I'm saying? So I see them as like, I see part-timers as, as like auxiliary forces or full-time, so, you know, full-time revolutionary support, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So I wanna just, you know, like I heard that and I'm like, you know, people come in, you got, you know, you got to crawl, walk, and then you can run, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's what I got to say right there. So I think that was a comment that I had made in the opening remarks. And when I say there's no a part-time revolutionary, I don't mean that you have to have a full-time job as a revolutionary. That's not what I meant. What I meant is that as a, there's no part-time revolutionary because if you're a revolutionary, this is your whole life. So when you're working whatever job you might be working, you are revolutionary at that job. When you are um, off from work, you are revolutionary in that off time. Even if you're not mobilizing or organizing with people, you're studying. It's a full time. It's a lifestyle. That's what I'm talking about when I say there's no part time revolutionary. I would I would say to like your point too, right? Um, it kind of goes with what my brother was just saying. It's like. Yeah, that might not be, you might not have like a full-time role in the org, right? But it's your job and whatever it is that you're doing to be a leader in that. And that's like, that is still, you know what I mean? And it's a commitment that you make. So it's even if it's like, we got people who pick up and drop our groceries off to us, right? That's an auxiliary force. You're not coming to pack the groceries. You're not distributing the box. But like, bro, we need you. But we need you to be fully present so that you can do those things, if that makes sense. And like, I need you to be a leader in that role. So I think if that makes sense, right, like that, to your point, like, yeah, you don't have to be a thousand percent there all day, never sleep, woo -woo, but it's the it's the mentality that you have. It's the way that you move through life. Right. It's the way that when you see you going through, your, you going home from work and you see your brother pulled over and you're going to pull over and make sure that this pig ain't going to do nothing to that. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's that. This makes me think of not necessarily responding to your point, but just a general theme that I hear, especially in organization. Uh, two words I hear, maybe three words. Two things is capacity is like the favorite word in people's organizations and self-care. And I think this is also, yes, we have to have balance. Yes, we have to take care of ourselves. But part of the cultural imperialist war is to get us to divest from the hard work that it is going to take to make revolution from the discipline that is going to take to make revolution. We're talking about we had capacity, but we spent two hours scrolling on Instagram. We're talking about at capacity, but we spent three hours on HBO or Max or whatever they call it these days. Right? So how do we develop the strength and the discipline and honestly just the fortitude, the fortitude to not be soft? We gotta be strong individuals if we're talking about fighting against the biggest machine known to man. We're talking about defeating the United States of America. We're talking about defeating Zionism. It's going to take some strong individuals. It's going to take discipline. It's going to take a lot of love for ourselves and a lot of love for our people. Because in my opinion, how are we going to have self-care with the heel of imperialism, the heel of capitalism always on our necks? The best self-care is revolution. Hey, peace and black power. Um, I made some notes and I'll try not to be too long winded, but I think there's an is element. It a question? It's, it is a question. Okay. It is a question. Make it sure. No, it's a question. And I'll just get right to it. Um, how have y'all combated the issue of, how can I say this? Not, all right, we're dealing with poor people, a lot of people who don't necessarily have the funds. So when we're doing this work, I think there comes an issue where, um, we're asking people who don't have money to fund stuff that needs money to help them out if that makes sense. And then you have this recurrent cycle and then eventually you have a lot of these groups having to go to the government to get funds to help the people, but yet we know the government's not trying to help 
those people. So it almost becomes this recurring cycle where you're asking for grants from the government that we know is, isn't supporting us. So I'm curious if y'all have had any ways of um, combating that in your work in your respective organizations in your areas. I know in Virginia, that's been a big issue as far as you have smaller organizations that's trying to do the work, but then you have bigger organizations like the NAACP and other, you know, um, co-opted quote unquote black organizations that's um, saying they're feeding the people, but really they're just taking hundreds of thousands of dollars and mining each other's pockets. So I'm just curious as far as in y'all's work, how have y'all been able to combat that? So just for time constraints, I want to get two responses. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, I think it's important to build economic institutions, your, your organization, so you're not completely, you know, relying on on people who are living in poverty to, to give you resources. Uh, but build the institutions, you made a point about them going to the government. Uh, that's why it's important for us to have institutions where the people can really, you know, depend on on us you know, to be able to service them or, or provide those needs um, rather than than the state, because that's part of the struggle that we have, right? It's like, what are you doing for the people? Um, so if we just have our hand out, I think like that's a serious contradiction um, when we're going to the people. Um, but yeah, but that's how we've been really like dealing with it. And we don't make it like church, no offense to you know, people who go to church, but it's not like making you feel bad if you don't have the resources. But if you do have the resources, you know, as, as Malcolm say, like these are freedom dollars, you know, like this is going towards your liberation. Or whatever. Um, I also wanted, to, I'm gonna be real brief because I think we actually have a whole panel later that's on that topic about 501c3 and what's the role and, and is there a role for 501c3s and liberation movements. Um, but I will say, well, one thing I wanted to say, though, quickly about that point is I think that we also have to recognize how, um, you know, we have to recognize how, uh, what, what is being, what the money is being used for and how the money is being, uh, purposed, right? So there's a, you can have funders and this is how oftentimes how fund foundations and funders do. Right, they give you money, even if it's not from the government, but it's from a private organization. They give you money with stipulations about how you're going to use that money, right? And that's straight up co-optation, right? That's part of how the 501c3 nonprofit industrial complex was born. That was part of the purpose of it. Um, sometimes you can get funders that do the, that, you know, have quote unquote unrestricted funds, or you can utilize the money for whatever, and you know, use that money if you if it's free money. I know I ain't gonna be mad at it. Use that money for the people. Um, but I do think to my brother's point here is when we talk about creating a, a alternative economic models, we have to also be thinking about how we're creating those models, right? So um, we also have to be in, in, intentional about, uh, you know, part of our praxis is building alternative systems. So we can't be building up, you know, uh, companies that are going to be exploiting workers because it's going to be supposedly funneling money into an organization. Why, why not build a cooperative? Right? Why not build other cooperative economic models to be able to build businesses, but that are worker owned, so we're not exploiting workers that are um, utilizing those resources. And I think when we think about those alternative systems of, of economics and alternative funding streams for our organizations, we should be creative and intentional about how we're going to be doing that. Because even with those unrestricted dollars, if you have a 501 c 3 they're going to dry up at some point if you're actually doing the shit that you're supposed to be doing. Excuse me for cursing. But um, if you're doing the actual revolutionary work, you are not going to be funded by by by, uh, by these billionaires at foundations for the, the long haul. It might happen in a moment, but as soon as it's exposed, that's going to dry up real quick, and you got that. You have to rely on your own uh, on your own to be able to come up with that ways and mechanisms to be able to do the work. That was a good point, Kwame. Um, and there's a question over here, and then we'll go back over here, and then we'll you'll be the last two because we're running out of time. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Langston. Um, I really appreciate um, all the panelists and the work that y'all do to address the basic necessities of our people in the community for the goal of building national unity to get to the point of engaging in war. Um, and I really appreciate your point of building alternative economic systems and institutions so that we can build our own capacity to address our people's needs to get to the point where we can engage in this war. Um, so my question to the panel 
how in y'all's work are you seeing the role of black business owners and black entrepreneurs in building our capacity? Um, and is there a space for them to contribute and be a part of building our collective capacity to address our needs? I, I wanted to take that because I think, at least for me, that gets to the, the point I was making earlier about the consciousness, right? And our, our business people have to understand, um, like Kwame Ture said, like, no African has gotten to any position with the support of every other African, right? And so I think, again, if you look at the neocolonialism that we're up against, right, like, Jay-Z's made out to be, like, our hero because this nigga's a billionaire and, like, right? And so when you see those things, it's hard for it's hard for the black businessmen to then say, oh, yeah, I'm going to pour back into the community because what his goal or what he's been taught so long, right? I mean, go to back talk, right? Give me, give me, give me, push, push, push. And and that's how you win, right? And that is how you win in business here. You, It has to be about you, truly. Um, and so I think that there has to be a shift in the consciousness of like, how does this work, right? Um, somebody was telling me like, you know, our ancestors, regardless of whatever church they went to, they used to give 52 times a year, whether it was a penny, a quarter, a whole bunch of money, right? Like, but it was because they, they understood the need for those institutions, right? So when we understand the need for our own institutions, for our own schools, for our own hospitals, then you will start to see those black businesses pour into that. But I think right now, again, the concept of where we're at, most people are still trying to survive. They're just still trying to be Obama, they're still trying to be Jay-Z, they're still trying to be what these crackers have told them to be, right? And so when that comes into play, they're not willing to pour back into the community unless it's something that's safe and acceptable. And like he said, they're not gonna fund you, right? We we have a whole NBA team, right, in our city, and we are one donation from one of their players that didn't even cover the cost of rent. But I know that you spend it on lunch or dinner or but you don't see it as a priority and necessity to pour into this and make these institutions viable long term. So I think that's what it comes down to. How are we able to convince people that again these institutions are needed long term for our people? Yeah, to add on to that, I think sometimes we can uh, draw out the contradictions or but not necessarily have a, a program to address black businesses because we do need capital. We do need economic development. That is a fact. We need to be able to fund organizations, but how is the structure of the business working? You know what I'm saying? Like, how are we actually engaging with business owners uh, with our ideology to move it forward? Because I need to get merch printed for our organization. I'm going to go to someone, you feel me? My own people. And he understands what we're doing, so he gives us a 20% discount. He ain't making no money off us. So it's like a reciprocal relationship. Then we post them on Instagram. I support him, you feel me? So it, it, we have to have a, a, a reciprocal nature. Um, and oftentimes we talk about black business, the first thing we think about is black capitalism. That doesn't have to be the, the, the first mode of thought. We can think about economic cooperation. We can think about building uh, a new system of economics. We can think about uh, funding our movement. Because if we ain't, if we just rely on donations, we see the state of the economy. We just rely on 501c3s. <laughs> We know exactly what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to contain revolution. It is run, these 501c3s, these foundations, all these foundations is ran by the CIA, right? So we uh, have to have a, a strategy to work with black businesses. We have to uh, develop our own businesses to where we're able to actually be a nation. We need land, we need food, we need housing. How are we going to develop that? And now what is the structure of that business, right? That's, that's what we gotta look at. Thank you. And just real quick, if it's if it's cool, like 30 seconds. I'm going to count for 30 seconds. Go ahead. I'm going to say, um, again, we have to address the root cause of our issue. Our root cause of our issue is based off of capitalism. So if any, any entrepreneur that is trying to build uh, their own business in that same type of model is, a, is, an, is an opposition to our people and our movements. Um, however, that does not mean that opening new markets and being able to build businesses has to ascribe to the capitalist model. If you're doing so in a cooperative type of way, kind of like a, what, what Boss was saying, like that I think is, you know, we need that, right? But uh, also recognizing that a lot of entrepreneurs, 99% of entrepreneurs I've come in contact with that speak the talk of trying to build liberation ultimately tend to be 
co-opting liberation, right? So there's always, a, I think there is always a guard up when that that topic comes up, but I do think that there is a place for building those businesses um, in a way that is constructive for our movement. I mean, I be taking that rebellious, revolutionary spirit so seriously. You know, y'all don't push back against rules every time. Um, you're next, and then only one person responds, please. Thank you. If you, if you want to direct the question to a particular person, you can. No. Uh, my, name is, my name is Ungazo Laughing House. I'm a member of Black Workers for Justice and also the North Carolina Public Service Workers Union, UV Local 150, in North Carolina. I just want to make an observation. I just think that uh, learning from what we uh, have done in the past, it's very important that we have gender balance on every single panel. I, I know when I see all men there, I'm, I'm just sort of very concerned about that. This was an error. This was an error that my generation made in the 60s and 70s. We cannot continue. We gotta make sure there's gender balance every single pa panel. The other thing I want to raise, labor has always been the foundation of what keeps this economy running from slave labor to labor today. Black people, 92% of us are workers. We work for wages, we work for salaries. During the pandemic, it was apparently clear to all of us that we were the essential workers. We were the sanitation workers. We were the hospital workers, the ones that produced the meat, the food, kept the hospitals running. There is no way we can have a revolution without understanding and you speaking to the central role of organized black workers and black working people in general when we make up 92, this is the latest census report. We're working, making this system rip profits from us every day. We build the houses, we build the economy, and they still take our labor and they make billions of profits. No one has spoken to this question in terms of the strategic role in the Black Liberation Movement and the broader movement, the international movement, of the role of black workers and unions. I just want to offer a quick self-criticism uh, because uh, international president of an organization did tell me to reference the panel, that there not being any women on the panel. Um, so I want to put out that self-criticism and uh, I do appreciate, though, this panel being led by a woman, though. A black woman. Um, and I agree. I, I often go to conferences a lot, and it's always a lot of men. So, And I, I do think it's important that we uplift black women because we are the backbone of every movement and every success that's ever happened. Thank you. First off, thank you for the panel. I enjoyed it very much. Um, on the context of holistic revolutionary work, uh, how do y'all model the care for one another that we're looking for in a world in your organizations uh, without falling into the trap that was already discussed of organizers organizing for organizers? What does that look like? I would love to take that one. Um, I think it gets back to like that at least for us, right, at Neighbor Program, it gets back to love, and it gets back to, like, we're really grounded in, uh, we, we read revolution is love. In that way, right, um, it's caring for each other, right, and, and, like, when you read that poem, Sada's talking about what are you willing to sacrifice, right, she's talking about making the world user-friendly, right, that means, like, you got to get out of the way to make it better for other people, some about learning from other people, learning from your children. And that, and that makes us stop and say that we have to learn from people who are younger than us, people that we think are inferior, right? Or, and, and I think that really gets to the heart of what we're doing in the community. We can't be above the people. When we, like, if we're giving out groceries, that's a, 
that's a point to have a political education conversation, right? Just like engaging. And sometimes the best political education is just a real conversation, getting to know someone, because now they know you care. Why do you care? Oh, you are African. Like, I'm African. Like, we can, like, there's so many things we could do. And I think within our organization, and I, I'm, like, our team is experiencing this right now as we are going through a transition, um, watching how each other, each other shows up for each other, right, and loves on each other and is willing to step up when the other one needs, hey, I need to step out, but I can, you can step in. And again, that communal sense, right? And I think that's what is able to build us up. Um, because again, we have to heal ourselves. Like if I said, like, we have to learn to love ourselves. That's something that has been stripped from us. Our dignity and love of ourselves has been stripped from us, right? Or been tried, but been stripped from us. And so we got to get back to loving ourselves and loving our people for just who they are. That's a great point, Jordan. Um, so we're going to close out now. I want to give each panelist 30 seconds for a closing statement, and I will cut you off. Go ahead. I'm going to start rapping real quick, man. Uh, political education, 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 education. We've got to educate ourselves, to liberate ourselves. Uh, I, say, I would say that our ideology is our strongest weapon. Our ideology is stronger than any imperialist nuclear weapon. We have strong political education and strong ideology. That is the hardest part. If we develop our national unity and have education, that's going to be the hardest part. So once we can educate and free our mind, everything else is going to follow, inshallah. Plus one, the political education, um, others also central to our organizing has to be our people. Um, there are so many organizations and, or, and organizers who only talk to other organizers and other organizations and don't actually build mass political power. When I say political power, I do not mean any kind of political party. I mean mass power for the for the main goal of seizing the means of production and freeing the land. So, um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Again, I'm going to come to love. I think that if we learn to love each other, that political education comes. I think all those things are really we have to learn to love each other. We have to have, like Kwame Trace says, an undying love for each other. Um, and so I just hope that um, we can continue to, through moments like this, through going into your community, through whatever it is, right, you learn to love yourself, you learn to love your community, because um, as we learn to love better, we're all going to be better, and that allows us, right, to get to that freedom spot. Because if I love you, I'm willing to fight for you. That, I mean, that's that's what it comes down to, right? And I can tell you, I can look in this room and just see you as an African and say, I love you. Once we can do that as a people, man, we're going to be unstoppable. Yeah, I just want to leave with the theme unity in our lifetime. I want to encourage everyone to go back to your community, whatever city that you're from, build with the organizations there. We need a united front. Um, and the last thing I say, I know this is being recorded, so just like let the people know, stop Cop City. All right, and hands off Uhuru, Uhuru. Thank you guys so much. Um, I hope y'all really enjoyed this panel, and I agree, stop Cop City to the Cop City, stop. <laughs>